Hey class, uh, welcome to another lecture. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about the spinal column and the muscles of the trunk, movements of the trunk, uh, muscle actions, all that, all that good stuff, right? The stuff that you would come to expect by now. Um, I do have to say I'm currently being fueled by Kill Cliff. 10 out of 10 would not recommend lemon berry flavor. If you are a energy drink consumer, one, we have a lot in common, two, I would not try this flavor. So when we're talking about the the trunk and, and really the thorax, or the axial skeleton, if you will, we're going to be talking um, a lot about the spine. And what's going on with the spine is approximately 24, not approximately, literally, we're going to have 24 articulating bones, and then we're going to have nine fused bones. So those 24 articulating bones are going to be comprised of our seven cervical spine, or seven cervical vertebrae, making up our cervical spine. We're going to have 12 thoracic vertebrae. That's going to be in the chest region. Then we're going to have five lumbar vertebrae. So if you do the math, seven plus 12, 19 plus five, 24, right? We just got through our articulating. Now we're going to move into our nine fused. These are going to be our sacrum and our coccyx. Uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit when we were talking about the, the hip joint specifically, but here, here it comes back again. Nine fused vertebrae, five sacrum, four coccyx. Uh, the first two cervical vertebrae, this is, this is something that's kind of cool. The first two cervical vertebrae actually have relatively different shape than the rest of the cervical or thoracic or sacral vertebra. Um, they're really, or lumbar, I guess. They're really going to be set up to allow for us to have all of the cranial movement, all of the head-based movement that we actually experience. So it allows for us to have forward and backward flexion, extension, rotation, um, basically moving about in an XYZ axis because of the way that the the atlanta occipital and, and atlanta axial joints are going to be created it, it, it's really a cool thing also when we're talking about the spine we need to be thinking about what is normal versus non-normal curvature so we've already talked about kyphosis and lordosis we did it we went over that in the first lecture or in the first couple of uh, lectures first exam I'm not going to harp on it all that much today but what I want you guys to pay attention to is that there is actually three normal curves to the spine, right? So the spine's not going to be perfectly straight up and down. We're going to have a cervical curvature. We're going to have a thoracic curvature. And then we're also going to have a lumbar curvature, right? So it is normal to have this anterior convex curvature of the cervical spine. You're going to have a concave um, concave curvature in the thoracic region, and then you're going to have another convex uh, curvature in the lumbar. So if we had excessive curvature in one of these regions, it would be, it, it would probably result in kyphosis or lordosis. We can also have like an S-like shape through our through our, our vertebra. So if you're viewing someone in the frontal plane and you see that they're kind of their their spine curves in an S, that's scoliosis. So here is the atlas and the axis. So this is going to be our, our first and second cervical vertebra. So atlas up top, axis down here on the bottom. And as you can see, um, what, what, you, and what you're going to see across the next several slides as we're talking about vertebra is that they're, most of them are going to have very similar attributes, right? So they're, they're going to have vertebral foramens. They're going to have transverse processes. And they're, most vertebra are also going to have spinous processes. These don't. So if you look at the atlas, they actually have these superior articular facets. And what these do is they allow for the occipitus of the skull. So they actually allow for the skull to sit down onto it. And then it allows for a rotation and a movement to actually occur at this joint with the skull on top of the atlas. If we move down and we look at the, I almost just knocked over my energy drink. If you look down at the axis, you can see that it will actually fit right up into the atlas. And that's for good measure, right? It's the second vertebra, cervical vertebra. And what's going to happen is by allowing this to sit on top of the axis, it's going to provide more structure, but it's also going to allow for a greater level of movement to occur. So for the rest of the cervical vertebra, what we're going to have is we're going to have a a decent size or moderate sized body of the vertebra. We're gonna have a fairly large opening for the vertebral foramen. This is where the spinal cord is actually gonna be running through. 
we start to see the appearance of the spinous process. So this is going to be a site of muscular attachment. We're also going to have articular facets so that other vertebra can actually articulate with uh, the vertebra inferiorly to it or superior and inferior to it. So it actually allows for a site of articulation. And then we're also going to have these transverse processes that serve as sites of muscular attachment as well. So by having all these muscular attachments around the vertebra, it allows us to push and pull, or not ever really technically push, but it allows us to pull in multiple directions so that we can get different types of movement and, and lateral flexions and extensions and all these different things actually across the vertebra. As we move into the thoracic vertebrae, you can actually see that that body has changed, right? That body has gotten bigger. That body has gotten a little bit taller and it's it's done so so that it can actually have a greater level of weight bearing or load bearing you can also see that we have that spinous process and transverse process that are still back they're still towards the the posterior side of the vertebra we still have the vertebral foramen right those things are still going to stay there but what we now have is transverse costal facets so this is actually going to be the spot where ribs in the vertebrae actually articulate. So our ribs are gonna attach onto this transverse costal facet and provide a set of um, small levels of articulation. So moving down into the lumbar, you can see that that body's now gotten even bigger. It's, it's more dense, it's, it's wider in every way. The vertebral, for, vertebral foramen's actually shrunk down. We don't have as much spinal cord running through here. Transverse process is still there. The spine of the of the vertebra is still there, um, so it's it's actually ready to handle higher loads of force and and actually be able to shock absorb a little bit more. If you remember back to the first couple of lectures, we talked about the axial skeleton and and how the axial skeleton was serving structural as well as protection. And a lot of that protection is going to come from our ribs. Our our ribs are going to actually hold some of our most important organs inside of them. So our ribs are actually going to contain our heart our lungs, our pulmonary arteries, the aorta, right? So we're going to we're going to contain a lot of really really good stuff inside of the ribs. So it's going to provide protection, structure, support, everything. Our ribs are not just ribs. Like all ribs are not created the same, I guess is a way to put it. We're going to have true ribs and false ribs. So in total we have about 12 pairs of ribs. 7 are true. True just means that it has a an attachment at the vertebra and an attachment at the sternum. So there is a vertebra sternal connection. So it connects all the way around, wraps all the way around the body at the sternocostal joint and the vertebra costal joints. We're also gonna have five pairs of false ribs. Now false ribs are not considered true ribs because they don't actually attach directly to the sternum. So there's actually an indirect attachment. So they're no longer vertebra sternal, right? They're, they're vertebrae based, they still have origins or they still have an attachment to the vertebra, but they don't have true attachment sites on the sternum. We're also going to have two pairs of floating ribs. Our floating ribs or our, our lower ribs, if you will, are not true ribs. They actually don't. They attach to the vertebra, but they do not attach to the sternum at all. This is just a little bit more information for you guys and a little bit cleaner way of viewing actually how the ribs attach to the vertebra or how we have an articulation site between the vertebra and, and the ribs itself. So since we've talked about the bones, when we put multiple bones together, we get joints. Let's talk about the joints. So our first joint is we're working our way down from the from the cranium, from the from the head, the dome piece, whatever you want to call it, down into the spine is going to be the Atlanta occipital joint. So this is where the, the cranium and the vertebra actually meet for the first time. It's if you look at the base of the skull, there's occipital condyles. So there's actually um, these protrusions on the bottom side of the skull that will fit right inside of the fossa on the atlas. And this allows for that, that flexion and extension, right? So it, it's actually going to allow for this frontal or sagittal plane movement of, of flexion and extension because it, it allows, it's actually like a groove-like structure that allows those condyles to articulate. Moving down one level, we're going to have the Atlanta axial joint. So this is where the atlas and the axis are actually going to be articulating with each other. So the atlas is C1, the axis is C2, and this is going to be the site of rotation. So the, the Atlanto occipital joint is going to be the site of predominantly flexion extension. There's some lateral flexion, not a whole bunch, but there is some. 
um, the Atlanta axial joint is going to be the highest level of rotation. So this is where most of our rotation is going to be occurring. Um, this is our most mobile joint of any two vertebrae. So as we move further up for the Atlanta occipital or as we move further down for intervertebral joints, you're going to see that there's not a whole bunch of motion. Um, here, this is the highest level of motion that we can attain with vertebrae. Something that's kind of neat about the vertebrae is that it is as essentially like a series of very small movement joints, right? So think about it like a flexi straw, if you will. I know that sounds stupid, but go with me here. At each individual intervertebral joint, at each individual intervertebral space, realistically, there's not much movement that can occur. There's some sliding that can occur, or gliding, if you will, but there's not a whole bunch of movement that can occur. However, as we start and we take to pair together those joints and we start to put together all of the movement, we can actually get pretty gross levels of movement. Just like you can bend a flexi straw all the way down to the front, you can bend and flex your spine or you can extend your spine or you can have lateral flexion in either direction. So it's actually going to be the cumulative level of movement occurring at these joints that's going to provide us this high level of movement or this high level of gross movement that can occur in the axial skeleton. I feel like we would be remiss to not really talk about herniated discs or the intervertebral discs. So essentially what the intervertebral discs are is they're, they're a, a very collagenous fibrous thing like disc essentially that's going to sit between the vertebrae and it, what it's going to be doing is it's going to be providing shock absorption and sliding motion or gliding motion it's going to actually be decreasing the friction and allowing for some of that movement to be occurring essentially what you have when you have this this intervertebral disc is you have two different layers you have a fibrous layer which is annulus fibrous and you have nucleus pulposus and what happens when you have a herniated disc is you actually have a leaking out of that nucleus pulposus. So you actually have a leaching or a movement out. And when you get that, that movement or that protrusion out of the nucleus pulposus, what it's going to actually do is it, it can put pressure on the, on, the vert, on, on the spinal cord, but it can also uh, manipulate the amount of movement that can actually occur within that joint and it's also going to minimize the amount of shock absorption and, and compressive, uh, mitigate, compression mitigation that can actually occur within that um, vertebral space. So as we're going through and as we're learning the, the trunk movement, it's gonna be a little bit easier because essentially the term is gonna tell you exactly what's going on. So it's gonna tell you what region we're working on. It could be cervical flexion, cervical extension, lumbar flexion, lumbar extension, lateral lumbar extent, like, it's going to be a little bit more self-explanatory. But something that I want you guys to know is that the majority of the movement that we're gonna have is gonna occur from this, the cervical or from the lumbar. We're not gonna have a whole bunch of movement that's gonna be occurring within the thoracic spine. Generally, if it's, if it's lumbar moving, we're gonna have thoracic, and it's really not going to have as much movement associated with, with it. So, with that being said, we're gonna have cervical flexion and lumbar flexion. So you can see again, there's not a whole bunch of movement occurring, occurring with that thoracic spine. Instead, it's going to be predominantly occurring within this lumbar region as well as on the cervical region up here. Just like we have flexion, we're gonna have extension. So we can have cervical extension and then lumbar extension. You can see that the majority of that movement's occurring down here in the lumbar spine. It's not occurring in the thoracic spine. Lateral flexion is going to be the side bending. So it can be cervical lateral flexion, which would mean moving the ear closer to the shoulder. Or we can have lumbar lateral flexion, which would be moving the shoulder closer to the hips. Reduction is going to be um, the return from flexion back to neutral position. So back to anatomical position. So rather than it being extension, it's just it's it's a reduction. So we're actually moving back into center. At the Atlanta axial joint, we're going to have the predominance of that cervical rotation ability. So we're going to be able to have rightward and leftward cervical rotation. So whichever, if you're taking the right ear closer to the right shoulder, 
cervical rotation to the right, left ear closer to the left shoulder, left cervical rotation. Same thing with the lumbar, we can have right and left lumbar rotation. On the next video, we're gonna move into the muscles. So we're actually gonna be talking about muscles that are moving the head, the spine, everything.